Okay, Richard Gerber, you're from uh, the UK. Thanks for joining us. Um, you spoke a lot about um, empowerment, um, but how do you actually teach critical thinking, first to students but also to teachers, and to find new ways of, of teaching? I, I think it's a really good question. I think the first thing is this whole thing about context and experience. So, for example, education, as I said earlier, is actually a very small C conservative industry, if you like. Um, teachers have all been through very similar routes in their lives to arrive at the point they've arrived at. They go into a profession where they're passionate um, about the job they do and about they, they take their roles and responsibilities very seriously. But it's a very insular profession. And one of the great things about the challenges of education is you have to draw on a raft of experience. You know, if the job of a teacher is to prepare for kids for their futures, teachers have to have the opportunity themselves to have new experiences. Because it's new experiences that stimulate thinking, critical thinking. The new experiences um, then give them an opportunity to reflect on their own practice. Um, it gives them the opportunity to start to think about new strategies and solutions to new problems. And does that apply to you as well? I mean, are you committed to lifelong learning? Oh, absolutely right. I mean, one of the things I did when I chose to leave my position as a, as a school principal was actually because I wanted to spend some time travelling around the world, meeting new people, finding out new paradigms, new systems, new approaches, not just in education, but across the, the globe, in, in business, in industry, in culture, in the arts. And actually what I found in the two years since I gave up my job is I would make such a be much better teacher now than I was two years ago just because of the quality of that experience. And I think the same then is mirrored in, in what we need to do for our children. Schools are in danger of being very enclosed spaces where children learn set things in set ways in a very familiar pattern. You know, there are timetables, there are syllabus, there are lessons that are, are constructed to particular structures. Um, what we have to do is regard education for children as far it needs to have far greater depth, far greater depth of experience in the same way it does for, children, uh, for teachers, because the only way we develop new thinking, new philosophies, the only way we can truly become critical is if we have a breadth of experience on which to base that constant developmental thinking, that constant critical thinking. So it's about breaking down the barriers and seeing education as beyond the walls of a building and an institution. Okay, so it's learning from other cultures as well. But Absolutely. I mean, right. also, I mean, uh, I mean we, we talked a lot about you know, new platforms and digital learning, but I mean, does sometimes does, does that actually become more of a distraction, or can we just use the best and leave I, the rest? I think what we have to do is trust the fact that it's part of the communication landscape today, and in many ways, it's giving young people all over the world experiences they would never otherwise have. For example, children who have wireless access to the internet now in certain parts of the third world in Africa and now being able to find out information, share experiences that five, ten, fifteen years ago, those young people would never have had, which of course transforms their thinking. I think the danger with everything new is that instantly uh, there is a large chunk of society that demonises everything that's new because they don't understand it, they feel threatened by it. I think like everything, it's a tool, it's another pathway. If what we do is just hurl ourselves headlong down that new pathway at the expense of everything else, we're doing our children and education in general a disservice. If we ignore it because it's a pathway we don't understand, we're equally doing it a disservice. I think what we have to do with some of these things is just trust the fact that we might not have complete control over these things yet, but actually we need to allow them in to our society, into our thinking, into our methodology, and allow them to evolve so that we might not have all the answers yet, good, bad, indifferent, or how to use these new pathways and tools. But what we've got to do is actually trust that process of evolution rather than feeling if we can't control it totally, it can't be of value. But isn't that, in a sense, of what happened in the 60s and 70s that you were talking about, and then the pendulum swung the other way? Yeah, I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about that in terms of a journey of discovery. I think you're right. I think the pendulum has come far too far the other way. And the problem also with education is, even in the 60s and 70s, you know, the paradigm has never been different. It's always been about academic performance. It's always been about preparing young people for one educational journey. That educational journey has always had academia at its forefront. You know, the pinnacle of education development is academic progress, whereas actually education is far wider than that. So what I'm not saying is that academic development and the skills you need to become academically successful, the ability to be resilient, to be um, to have mastery of basic skills, to be able to research, to be critical, um, to evaluate, to reference, all of those things are extremely important. 
But what we mustn't do is just regard education anymore as nothing but an academic pathway. What we've got to do is see education in the greater context and marry together the learning, the incredible learning that's happened in education over the last 30 or 40 years. Because if we use it all wisely, we can create a really three-dimensional rounded experience. Great. Thanks very much. Is that all right?